Good evening and welcome to Westminster Abbey. Uh, my name is David Hoyle and I'm the Dean of Westminster. Uh, you've come tonight, as I'm sure you know, to the One People Oration, which has been held nearly every year uh, for over 50 years. And on this occasion, a guest speaker addresses issues of importance, not only for the Christian community, but also for all humanity. Uh, that one people phrase was first used here by one of my predecessors, Edward Carpenter. The oration is now organised by Westminster Abbey Institute, which was founded in 2013 by the Abbey, uh, to nurture moral and spiritual values in public life and service. So that's what the Institute is setting out to do, and it's at the heart of what we're trying to do this evening. This year's speaker is uh, Dame Cressida Dick, who probably doesn't really need any more introduction from me, but uh, brought up in Oxford and later an Oxford graduate, she joined the Met in 1980. From 1995 to 2000, she worked with Thames Valley Police, returning to the Met in 2001 to take on senior roles, including anti-gun crime work and counter-terrorism operations. In June 2009, she became the first woman to hold the rank of Assistant Commissioner substantively and oversaw the Met's preparations for the 2012 London Olympics. Uh, retiring from the Met, she thought, in 2015 to work for the Foreign Office, she returned in 2017 as Commissioner. In that role, she has led a service affected by cuts to budgets and staffing. Latterly, of course, she's faced intense public scrutiny in the wake of the murder of Sarah Everard and an allegation of institutional corruption made by the panel investigating the death of Daniel Morgan. Just a word about this evening and how it works. Dame Cressida and I will be in conversation for about 40 to 45 minutes, I hope, and then we'll take audience questions. Please keep your question brief. I rather anticipate that uh, those questions will cover a variety of topics. I'll just remind you what I said at the beginning about the work of the Institute. We invited Cressida here uh, to come and talk about leadership and public service. So in my conversation with her, that's where the questions are going to be focused. So we'll start with that business of leadership and service. Uh, I have a priest friend who was uh, formerly a policeman in Liverpool, and I asked him once about life in the police force. I was very quickly corrected. I was in the police service, David. It's all about service. So what does that mean to you? What is it like to lead within a police service? Well, uh, Mr. Dean, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, I've been to these events before, um, and uh, I am uh, humbled to be standing uh, in this abbey and uh, as part of that uh, tradition. Uh, so thank you very much to you and, and the Institute. Um, I think we've agreed that in relation to this first question, I may be indulged to speak for a little longer. Um, so apologies for that. If you've fallen asleep at the end of the first, rest assured that I will be faster and pacier uh, in the others. But hopefully that will give um, old friends and new uh, the opportunity to kind of sniff me out a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, like when dogs meet each other, just kind of get their feel for me a bit and, and then you'll, you know, be able to focus um, uh, the, the questions later on, perhaps a, a little bit more. So what does it mean to me to lead uh, in the police service? Well, first of all, um, at a very personal level, um, it's a, a great privilege. Um, it's a joy. Um, it is, of course, a responsibility. Uh, and one has a great deal, quite properly, of accountability. Um, it is, for me, uh, a, a duty. Um, and it is always immensely interesting and fulfilling. I could go on. But just to talk a little bit about your friend and that phrase, I, I firmly believe I lead a service. Um, it's a service for all, not just those people who ask. Uh, it is a service which provides a protective and guardian function uh, as well as uh, responding to asks, of course. It's a service that we provide uh, to many people who actually don't want us at that moment doing that in their lives, uh, particularly, of course, offenders, 
Um, and we must do that uh, with um, respect and compassion. Uh, and therefore, it's a service which brings us on occasion into conflict with people and brings in manifest all sorts of ways uh, many, many ethical challenges. It's often said that the police are at the rubbing point uh, of society. It brings nowadays um, a great deal of scrutiny of my frontline people, all with their body-worn videos and camera phones around whenever they're doing their work. And a colleague of mine said in relation to uh, policing uh, as compared with um, the ambulance service, the angels, the fire service, the heroes. My officers, as we speak, there's someone out there being absolutely angelic and there's somebody being absolutely uh, heroic. Um, but of course, in some people's minds, some of the time, inevitably, even in the same situation, we could be heroic to some, angelic for others, uh, and you know, the villain of the piece as far as others are concerned. So for me, that uh, is kind of massively stimulating in terms of a service. And I'm in that, of course, not downplaying for one second the complexity of working in ambulance or fire or any other uh, public service. But the police have always been, uh, I would say, even in our kind of prehistory, when you look back through before the modern police service founded not far from here uh, in 1829, you know, we have been a service. And that somewhat hackneyed phrase, uh, no doubt, but the police are the public, the public are the police, often attributed to Peel, but actually probably not him, uh, pre him and post him, the first two commissioners, they were a job share, by the way, David, in 1829, went on rather a long time, but they were. But they were talking about, you know, the police being citizens in uniform. Yes, extraordinary powers, uh, but essentially citizens, not military, not interestingly spies, but citizens uh, of the people. And uh, we have these extra powers, but they made it very clear then, and it's been clear to this day, and most particularly now in our modern laws, that those powers must only be used as, as is required to achieve the lawful purpose, i.e., for example, in our tradition, using force must be minimized. Intruding into people's personal lives must be minimized. It must only be proportionate to what you're trying to properly achieve. And I think that's that fact that we have those powers, that we can use extraordinary force, for example, does make us a little bit different from some other services. And the fact that my people put themselves ahead of others is not unique, but it is absolutely required. Their lives are put on the line quite regularly. Uh, and uh, that puts special responsibility on leadership. And finally, something which puts special responsibility on leadership is that in the British policing model, you know, we depend entirely on the general consent of the public. Hence, back to, we're not a force. We don't impose ourselves willy-nilly. We are not an arm of the state. We depend, uh, uh, and we could debate this, but on the general consent of the public. So turning back to leadership, well, all my officers are required to lead, and many of my staff as well. Out there, if something happens, it'll be a constable, possibly with you know, three weeks service, who will be the first on the scene, and they must lead in that situation. So it's not just about, uh, of course, about senior people. Secondly, though, in my mind, the greatest importance lies with that front line, and also in many respects, the greatest discretion and the greatest impact. So part of my leadership role is to create an environment for them in which they can thrive. They can get on and do their job. They have a license to operate. It is made simple sometimes out of massive complexity. They are people who are hugely focused on their mission. <laughs> their mission, you know, if I speak at a passing out parade, we had one on Friday, and that some of you have been to those. You know, they want to help people, they want to protect people, they want to save life, they want to prevent crime. Those are the things they will come out with. They take an oath, which includes things like keeping the peace. Uh, of course, if a crime happens, investigating properly and impartially and ensuring that vict victims receive an appropriate service. But, uh, the beginning and the end in 1829 and today, in some senses, it's, it's quite a simple mission and they are utterly focused on it. So as a leader, the job is to not get in the way of that, 
and to give, of course, clear direction, to unify, to motivate, to set standards, critical and topical, to get resources in, to support them, to ensure uh, that uh, they have an appropriate amount of confidence. And on occasion, but only on occasion, very rare, really, to be in the command mode. And I appreciate I'm standing here in full pajamas and, you know, absolutely at a lectern. And interestingly, somebody, and I do that out of, you know, respect for the Abbey, respect for the fact that, you know, I'm here because I'm the commissioner and for no other reason. Um, but as I was walking here, one of my colleagues said, goodness me, you standing at a lectern in the tunic is kind of the opposite of the dominant leadership style that we mostly see in the Met. I am not a particularly, in this particular role, command and control leader. If there's a critical incident, if there's a major incident, people's lives are at risk, everybody needs command and control. The rest of the time, they probably don't. And in terms of command, people's lives on the line, there is an enduring responsibility well beyond the day I retire for those people whose lives have been put at risk or those people whose lives have been sadly sometimes uh, lost. I'm going to finish, I promise you, but something I feel passionately about is you couldn't do this sort of job unless you care. <laughs> unless you care, first and foremost, about the public, back to the public service. What is in the interest of the public? What is best, as far as we can tell, for the public? Not in an arrogant way, but what is best? Not what's an idle interest of the public, but what is best for... And public first. Officers and staff second. Those, that's what I care about. Leaders, you know, noise, me, a very long way behind. Care about the public. Care about my people in, in all senses. Care about upholding the law. Care about trying to do the right thing, even though many people will say it was the wrong thing on different sides of the equation. So service. As a leader, I think you are a servant. It's an old fashioned concept, no doubt for some. But I see myself as a servant of the public and a servant of my colleagues. I don't see that I'm leading a pyramid that this way, is with, this way up. I see myself supporting a pyramid that is like that. And my job is to listen to the public listen to my people, to try to understand, to try to help, to try to diffuse, to try to guide, of course, and, and cheerlead and it represent and explain. But it's also with the Met in this instance, to stand back, to say no, to be hypercritical on occasion, occasion and restless for uh, improvement. And it is finally to recognise that on my first day, I could have been gone on the second day. I might be gone tomorrow. I certainly will be gone in two and a bit years' time. I am merely a steward. And I ought to try to leave my Met, in its widest sense, in better shape than I found it and better shape for the future. Most people looking in will be asking, how is she managing today? Today's operations, last night, tonight. Some people will be very focused on how is she managing the past, which brings a huge and important strategic context. But everybody ought to be interested in how am I leading for the future. Thank you. There are a couple of things uh, I think we might come back to there. Um, if you use the mission word in the Abbey, you're likely to find it comes up to bite you again. Um, ah. <laughs> I talked uh, when, uh, when I was introduce, introducing you about public scrutiny. You've just talked about uh, the fact that you're very conscious of uh, your relationships all around you, but particularly with people uh, on the front line. Uh, it has always seemed to me, uh, in the positions of leadership I've had, uh, that those around us, especially those working with us, will notice very quickly if there is a mismatch uh, between what we say and then the way we behave. Uh, so in jobs like yours, it's, it's not all about performance. Your character is being uh, observed and assessed. I'd be interested to know if you could, well, I'd like you, please, just uh, to talk to us a little bit, tell us a little bit uh, about 
what has informed uh, the, the way you lead? What, um, what formed the character that we, we meet this evening? You might be better to ask my friends and family, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I think. But just to take your first point, I do agree entirely that if I, if I go for a second into my organisation, at every level of leadership that I have been in, I have been acutely aware that people are watching more than one might think, and they are watching very particularly for any gap between what you say and what you do. They uh, can see it like that, they can smell it, they can hear it, uh, and so forth. And um, of course, we all have a, uh, if you like, a, uh, a, a different set of personas to some extent. When I put my uniform on, I feel different from when I don't have it on. It may be the same for you, I'm not sure. It when is. I am standing up on the stage or being interviewed by the media, it is a slightly different mode of communication, way of being from if I was sitting at home with, with my partner having a chat. But if there is a huge gap between those personae and or if what you say is very different from what you do, in my view, you will be found out very quickly. And secondly, it is massively stressful. It, it creates a ter tremendous dissonance inside people all the time, um, uh, which, which, is, which you know, can un undermine somebody. So that brings me to my mum, <laughs> uh, what, ma what made me, my, my sort of character. Uh, my dad died when I was, I was pretty young. Um, and I think my kind of home life, in many respects, has, has created uh, the character that I am. My mother in the, and I know one or two of you, I think, in the audience were around at this point. Um, you know, in the 60s, uh, she, was, she was saying to me, no, no, you, you can do whatever your brother does. Quite unusual. You can, you can be whatever you want to be. Pretty, pretty unusual thing to say. Um, but at the same time, she had simply no time for arrogance um, or showing off, and, which is an interesting one, because she's probably here saying, well, don't show off too much. Um, why are you dressed up like that or whatever? Um, so confidence mixed with a, with a kind of a humility, I think, would, would have been her prescription. Uh, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't get too big for your boots. Recognise there's always somebody out there who knows better than you. I came from a family that had a long tradition of interest in sort of justice and social justice uh, and uh, quite a lot of people in the so-called caring professions, um, uh, which I think they are, but it's interesting. We, we don't always fit it. You know, we're not seen as that, although I hope I've said in my first answer, you know, I believe passionately that that the police service needs to care for everybody, including those people who don't care for us, one iota. Um, stoicism, a certain sort of grit, I think, uh, was expected when I was growing up, uh, together with uh, a kind of optimism and an outward look. A recognition that I was lucky, uh, that I was privileged, um, and that the, most, that the best thing I could do probably would be to find something I loved doing. <laughs> which I did, uh, and, and then uh, you know, I felt very supported by my family and my friends as I've done it. So if I fast forward, um, I guess my character to some extent has been um, framed by some of the f setbacks uh, along the way, the bad times as well as the good, um, definitely by lots of investment by me, sorry, in me, by bosses, by coaches, by mentors, by colleagues, by more experienced people, uh, by members of the public who've taken the trouble uh, to uh, approach me in different situations. I've always tried to have different strings to my bow so that I didn't become completely sort of stovepiped and institutionalized. And I think that's probably helped me a bit. And I've been exposed to lots of different leadership styles and environments, relatively speaking, uh, given that I have spent a great deal of time uh, in, in the last 40 years in policing. Uh, and most of the the time along the way, despite being very operationally focused, I have, because I'm quite a reflective character, tried to create the time and space in one way or another to, uh, to reflect. And as I've said, to have some distance um, so that I'm not completely institutionalized 
uh, completely just thinking the way it is is the way it ought to be, um, but always trying to make things better. Can we just stay with that last point for a moment? You, you talked twice now, but in the answer to the first question, the second question, about caring and how important that is. Uh, in jobs like yours, I guess, even oddly in jobs like mine, uh, big institutions have a life of their own, uh, and I think you can begin to go native quite quickly. You can, you can be formed uh, by the culture that you're, uh, you are in. I, I'm interested to know how, I mean, you just started talking about it then. I'm interested to know how you keep the bit of caring refreshed. What, what, what are the disciplines for, for stepping away, reminding yourself why you do the job, reminding, you what, reminding yourself what really matters? Because I'm assuming, I mean, it's fairly obvious, stuff is pouring across your desk all the time. So it's very easy to become a very reactive person. It, it, <laughs> It is. Um, it absolutely is. And, I, and I've known colleagues, um, you know, leave my service and say the very next day they saw everything very clearly. And six months later, they understood so much more than they did when they were doing it. We're, we're a busy service. We don't have what you might call um, the luxury of uh, being able to carve out lots of time, particularly for the operational deliverers, um, uh, for, you know, uh, training, education, reflection, la la la, without knowing that each hour spent on that is not spent delivering a service which is in short supply <laughs> and we are always trying to prioritise to, to, to the public. Um, but I, So I think you have to put in a discipline, you use the word discipline, you have to put in um, the discipline and I think you have to try to build in organisationally, I'm not saying we're perfect at this by the way or any of this, but organisationally and individually you have to try to build in um, kind of rotation and uh, uh, challenge and um, so in my particular instance um, I will spend a considerable amount of my time uh, you know walking in the shoes of, of my people out there with them or listening to them or spending time talking to you know groups about whatever it might be mental health or the challenge of dealing with trauma or assaults on police and likewise with, mem with, with members of the public. Um, so I, I value hugely the time that I spend with victims of crime, for example, uh, who give me their time to tell me, you know, how the service was or wasn't and how it feels. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's important to try to just continuously... I started on the beat just uh, a mile from here. Uh, I spent years out on the streets. Um, that's, you know, in so many respects, even in the modern age, where our um, purpose, <laughs> I won't use the word mission, is served, <laughs> uh, is, 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 is undertaken. Uh, and so staying grounded in that way and, and then reminding, you know, being surrounded by critics, I think is important and people who will, and, and close family as well. You know, um, my partner Helen is here. She's, she's, she can be my witness on this occasion that, you know, I, I've said to her when I started out on this job, you know, if I ever start becoming cynical, if I am ever really grumpy, if I ever lose my compassion, humanity, care, you've got to shout. And, if, and I say the same to my deputies and others. I'm not saying I'm, I am at all perfect in this, but I think it's something you, you have to be disciplined uh, about because the volume uh, and the... Um, intensity sometimes uh, can, uh, can degrade discipline about making some time and space for self and reflection. Um, I could go on. Thank you. I'm grateful. Note to self. Uh, let's take a step back from um, uh, this slightly more personal reflection. Uh, leadership and leadership training are a light industry these days, and the Institute is very interested in how we lead. Church of England now invests a huge amount of energy in leadership training. I wonder, do you think uh, leadership and service have changed in recent years? And if you're conscious of very particular challenges that need to be faced at the moment? So I, th I think in the, um, in the environment that in the public services we are leading in, and no doubt probably in private sector as well, you know, there are some just very obvious things um, for me, you know, the, 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 the extraordinary pace of change. 
uh, which means that you know you absolutely can't take anything for granted, and nor can you be complacent, and you have to lead in a way which is is future focused and and tries to encourage people to look to the future and recognise that we'll have to adapt and change. And we saw some extraordinary examples of that all over the place, but not least in the police, of course, when COVID struck. You know, we were incredibly flexible and incredibly adaptable almost over, overnight. Uh, and uh, that requires a kind of different way and knowing when to step in to, to direct and lead. Uh, and, and it requires a different kind of, um, yeah, sort of... Uh, mindset, I think, in leaders. You've touched on, and, uh, and we may come back to uh, scrutiny, <laughs> um, I think for institutions, there is a massive challenge at the moment um, that both the sort of level of scrutiny, the nature of scrutiny, uh, the, in the social media revolution, uh, uh, and uh, frankly, in the age of disinformation and false facts, uh, you know, there, is, there are some real challenges for leaders about uh, trying to maintain trust and confidence in the work of your people and, and where appropriate, the institution um, itself. Technology <laughs> just brings so many opportunities and so many threats. Um, for me, the, in policing, the polariz sort of polarisation we are seeing in society uh, has created some new challenges for us, uh, undoubtedly and veering into the slightly controversial, um, in my view, last few years, the politicisation of aspects of policing that would perhaps better be not politicised um, has, has, in my view, <laughs> and by the way, I think the two are inextricably linked, of course, um, but I think that has created some new and different challenges uh, for leaders. We've talked about the, the sort of relentlessness and the 24-7 and, and the lack of time and space. So how do leaders, you know, have time to reflect? How do they make good, considered decisions? How do they build the resilience to be able to do that? How do they ensure that people take time out uh, to look after themselves and, and, you know, what Claire from the Institute calls, you know, have time for ethical reflection? It, that's a real challenge, uh, uh, but vital at the moment. So for me... You know, there's a need for leadership uh, more, th more than ever. <laughs> um, but it certainly has to be very much less within the hierarchies. It has to be overall less hierarchical. Um, uh, and it's, it's much more about sort of working across networks and influencing people and having a more, uh, I use the word probably unknowingly, but trying to be careful, a more democratised style of leadership. Uh, seems to me to be absolutely necessary. And I don't want to overstate the challenges of today <laughs> because I look back at my predecessors and I can see when they faced enormous challenges and, you know, we were all reflecting only two days ago about the challenges of, of, of war, for example. Uh, so I don't want to overstate this at all. Um, there are so many people, perhaps in this room and beyond, who have had much more extreme challenges than being a senior leader in, in an organisation like mine at the moment. But I think it does, it certainly, I don't know whether it requires more, but it certainly requires uh, a kind of um, steadiness and resilience and a certain amount of um, courage. Uh, probably always did, um, but it certainly does. Thank you. Uh, it's seven o'clock. I suspect uh, my colleagues are going to start collecting questions now. Uh, so get them to the end of the rows, please. Uh, just staying with that for a moment. Um, I, I moved here from Bristol. Bristol's a wonderful city. Uh, I was very happy there. Uh, but it's a fairly lively place. Even so, coming to Westminster, I was very struck um, by the kind of volatility of the, the conversation here, the strength of opinion. Uh, and um, we're right next to the um, Palace of Westminster, so there's, there's a political um, agenda all around us. Uh, you, you've alluded to this a bit already. Do you, do you think people need to be... You talked about stoicism. Do you think people need to be more resilient than they did? Have you, have you found that, that's, that you're tested, your resilience is tested, or has that always been an issue? So I genuinely don't know whether it's re required more, but I have been a real believer for a very long time um, in the need to build resilience in, in, all, in all leaders, 
and support uh, their kind of confidence and their capability. Um, and I think for um, leaders in the absolute kind of public eye, uh, uh, there is a requirement for um, paying significant attention um, to, to resilience. Um, there, there, there just is. And I've seen some great people who've been totally derailed um, sadly and sometimes unnecessarily who might have been able to contribute so much more uh, and I, I look at you know what could I or we have done to help them build a bit more resilience to be able to give everything they wanted to uh, and um, you know I'm, I'm always thinking I'm sure lots of people in this room are thinking how, you know, how do you how do you build your own resilience and how do you build the resilience in your close team and then how do you build organizational resilience I just think it's one of the sort of three or four most key things yeah. currently. Thank you. Uh, we have our own language uh, in the Abbey. One of the things I have to look for quite often is uh, the temptations that lie around. Uh, they're the mistakes that you fall into easily because they look so good. Um, one of the things people don't understand about temptation is it doesn't appear bad. It always appears to be a rather good thing that you're being invited to do. <laughs> I think there's a temptation to draw status uh, from having an office uh, like being uh, a dean or possibly a commissioner. And then bizarrely, there's an opposite temptation, which is the imposter syndrome uh, that, uh, that can go with it. Um, how do you keep your sense of self uh, when you're beset by uh, those kinds of challenges? How do you stay strong and well? Um, well, I do, th I do think they, they are... Um they are real challenges, and um, again, people will be looking <laughs> a lot to try to make sure that one is not falling into either of those, and, and sometimes those critical eyes are just kind of um, projecting on their own problems or being completely unreasonable <laughs> about the, 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 the standard they're expecting, but normally they're, they, they are, you know, they're, they're kind of right. <laughs> So I remember when I first became commissioner, I spoke to lots of people in all sorts of sectors, you know, about what, 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 what do you think of the Met? What's the service we're providing? What do you what think would be a ha What are the hazards for, for a commissioner? Uh, and was given a, a lot of quite powerful advice, which I hadn't thought about quite so strongly, which was a, which was a lot about the so-called <laughs> temptations, uh, about, you know, not spending too much time on the wrong things. Mm about um, you do need to represent your service, but there's a narrow line between that and looking like it's all about you. Um, you need to be out there uh, in civic society. You don't need to be, to quote the Queen Mother, um, photographed with a glass in your hand. <laughs> you are a public figure. You don't need to be seen as a, as a celebrity. Um, uh, you are first and foremost a police officer and you, sh you must never forget that. And, and hence I've said, you know, things like being out on the streets a lot, uh, having people around me who say no, not yes, <laughs> uh, having critics outside the service and inside the service. Um, but hopefully having, you know, recognising the imposter syndrome is normal. Um, it just is. I mean, I can tell you when I last felt really, totally, utterly the imposter. Um, and it's when I, you know, I, 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 I walked into a, uh, a room of my colleagues who, and, and they were really pleased to see me and they were just sort of finishing their shift. And um, I thought, right, great, I can kind of listen to them. I can get some messages across here. Um, I'm taking an interest uh, in the way that I always do. That's important. And then suddenly sort of four or five calls came out and they just starburst. And then two or three minutes later, I heard that, you know, Fred had just done CPR. John had just caught somebody with a knife. You know, all these kind of very uh, vivid things. And I was sort of standing there thinking, oh, <laughs> well, you know, I, as I know, <laughs> it is not about me. Um, I wish I could go out and do that, their job as well as, I, as they do, but I can't. Yeah, I can wear a uniform and be on the street, but I'm not in the emergency response profession. Uh, and they're just much better at it than I am. And they are the real, the, you know, the real McCoy. And I'm 
what am I? You know, I had that moment. What, 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 what purpose do I serve in this situation apart from, well done, jolly good, you know, I'll make you a cup of tea when they come back in. Um, so imposter syndrome, I think, is normal. The thing is to, to have a sense of purpose. The thing is to keep faith. The thing is to look the big challenges really in the eye. Um, the thing is to like, look after yourself, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and thinking back to my mother, <laughs> the big thing is, you know, to quote um, Kipling, meet triumph and disaster, uh, and treat those two imposters just the same. Thank you. Uh, I have two more questions before we take uh, some of the questions that are being, uh, that have come from the floor. Uh, you've talked about uh, your mother and that encouragement uh, to, uh, to think about the possibilities uh, before you. Uh, you are the first female commissioner. Uh, in fact, there have been a number of firsts uh, for you in your career. Uh, what's it been like uh, to be uh, that first woman in, in these roles? Um. 99% it's just like being a person doing a job uh, it's it's my job and um, I'm doing it you know to the best of my ability uh, it's a great privilege and I don't think about being um, a woman or this or that or the other uh, very much um, however um, I do notice all the time that some other people do uh, and in particular, um, back to the passing out parades, uh, I quite often have people when I say, well, you know, what made you join the job? They'll say, well, you. And I think, well, I, pardon, excuse me. And they'll say, well, the fact that you are in this role and we think you're a bit different, that has made me think this is a service that I, I could join. Uh, for many uh, women and many um, people from other so-called minority groups. I think uh, it, it has some kind of symbolism. Uh, on occasion, it raises, probably amplifies my profile uh, on occasion. And on other occasions, um, you know, let's not, let's not pretend. <laughs> I don't trouble myself actually very much with why some people might have, you know, really kind of hateful approach. I don't trouble myself with why somebody has a particular downer, it appears, on you know, women or this, that or the other, as in terms of me, because life is too short. But there will be some who think, you know, still out there in society, who think that a woman shouldn't be in this sort of role, shouldn't have this sort of authority. Or others who just think, um, uh, you know, unwittingly, you know, they, they, they are basically respectful, but they forget, you know, I, I could be walking down the street with a male colleague even now, even though I'm re reasonably recognisable, and um, some members of the public will prefer to come up to the man, and they will assume that the man is the more, the more senior person. Now, see lots of women smiling in the audience, that's just called the authority gap, it's there. Um, I'm passionate about making sure that, you know, uh, women in my service and the women that we give a service to are treated properly, fairly, equally, etc., etc. Um, but I don't spend a lot of time worrying about that kind of thing myself because I, I, I just do think uh, life has treated me very well <laughs> and I have been given lots of opportunities uh, and I've had a brilliant time in my work and I still have a brilliant time in my work uh, and, um, you know, a bit extra scrutiny um, is, is, it goes with the job and isn't a surprise. Thank you. My last question, um, a, a brilliant time in your job. Uh, there are times, there have been plenty of times recently uh, when your job has been uh, pretty challenging and we need to acknowledge uh, difficulty and some controversy. Um, the last few months in particular have seen you uh, right in the midst of some very significant debates. Uh, there's some very strong feeling out there. You faced a lot of uh, personal public scrutiny. Uh, what do you feel about that kind of attention? Um, so I think, refer you to my former answer uh, <laughs> in that um, you don't come into a job like this without expecting uh, some tough times. You don't come into a job like this without expecting to be highly scrutinized 
you don't come into a job like this without expecting to be highly accountable. And I think that is um, a kind of good thing uh, that I am to some extent the lightning rod uh, for uh, my organisation. I can think of many others I'm not going to name where actually, who, you know, when something dreadful has happened, who are we going to decide is in fact the leader um, is quite hard to work out and um, in, in policing officers are required to you know account for their decisions and so whether they're going to court or they're standing up as the commissioner you know they're visible they're there they they are kind of it now we've we've had i mean i'm very proud of of, of my people as has probably come across uh, we, uh, I think we are genuinely in so many respects, you know, a world leading, if not the world leading police service. Um, but we've had a horrible year uh, in some respects. And in particular, you know, the horrific murder of Sarah Everard um, and some issues from the past being examined, you know, now uh, and uh, also, some other really bad, ex appalling examples of bad conduct by my officers. So I've been doing this job for nearly five years. I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, violent crime has reduced hugely on our streets in my time. I'm proud of the way that the guys and girls have dealt with some extraordinarily challenging incidents. Uh, you know, I arrived with the terrorist incidents in 2017 and Grenfell Tower Fire. I'm proud of the way we have carried on changing and improving and keeping our eye on the long-term future. I'm proud of so many aspects of my service. Uh, but four and a half years in, you know, we are, I said, you have to look in the face of some very, very, we're looking in the face of some very difficult challenges. And for me, um, leadership is not about sort of running away and saying, well, you know, uh, I've, done my, I've done, my, done my bit and it's getting tricky now. No, leadership is about, uh, is about st sticking in and leading people through tough times. And this is a very, very tough time. We may get a question about it. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a time in which, you know, quite rightly, many members of the public feel angry and let down. Um, so we've got to change. Uh, we've got to um, move forward from that. But we've also got to carry on <laughs> providing a dependable, reliable, capable, improving service in a whole series uh, of other ways. Um, so that's challenging, and um, I, I'm, you know, I hope p people have seen. I'm not an arrogant person. I don't think I have a right to be doing this job, uh, but I am doing this job, uh, and um, I will do it to the best of my ability through the tough times as well as the less tough times uh, for as long as I'm doing it. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions now uh, from, uh, that have come from our audience. Uh, just so you understand, um, a couple of my colleagues over there have uh, tried to, to choose a representative sample. Uh, so uh, we weren't sifting them to take out difficult questions. That was never the intention. We're trying to get a spread of the sort of things you were asking. So question one, you referred to the police's extraordinarily rapid adaption to the changes brought by COVID. From your vantage point, how has COVID changed society? And is there anything which we've learned that will endure and change the way policing will be undertaken? Um, what do you think we ought to have learned uh, or is the things that we might rapidly forget? Mm, goodness, well, you know, everybody here will have had their own personal challenges and, their, and for many, their professional challenges as well during COVID and the most terrible, um, terrible time, uh, imaginable in some senses. Um, so I think if I look, if I may, just through the policing yeah. lens and our work, um, I think uh, it's worth thinking back to March last year, uh, sorry, the year before, when, you know, I said, um, to my teams, we've got a health crisis, we need to do our level best to help with that as much as we can. We are not gonna have a crime crisis, we're not gonna have a security crisis, we're not gonna have a public order crisis at the same time, thank you very much. Uh, and we, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but we're gonna have to get out there and be there and be out in the communities. 
Uh, and I knew with their mission focus that there was no doubt that that's what they would do, whatever the risks and challenges. And people did put themselves at risk and they did so, uh, uh, I think, in, in an extraordinarily um, positive and capable manner. And we didn't have, uh, you know, rise, rising crime. In fact, crime, as you know, probably reduced uh, hugely. Uh, and we were very present and we were driving ambulances and we were going into houses with people who had COVID and we were dealing uh, because it wasn't just COVID, was it? We were dealing, of course, with some really difficult protests. Uh, and we were dealing with a um, set of restrictions on people's lives, the like of which we hadn't known uh, in any of our sort of mostly lifetimes, I'm sure, um, which the police were called upon to assist in the enforcement of. <laughs> and the most important thing I said to them, and you'll be the judge, uh, was we want to come out of this whenever that is, and of course and back in March then we had no idea how long it would be, but with relationships with the public better or at least as good as they are now. And that has proved a challenge, I, I am absolutely sure. We've seen society become more polarised, we've seen massive strengths of feeling about some social justice movements, uh, and the police, as I said, often at the rubbing point in the middle, <laughs> um, have uh, you know, been the subject of, of real ire. They're not the only sector, but on occasion real ire for both upholding the COVID restrictions and not upholding the COVID restrictions, depending on where you were on the equation. Um, so I am a believer in, in what, as I've sort of described, the kind of British policing model, uh, which is not about sort of law enforcement uh, uh, above all, it's not about using force, it's not about staying in barracks and coming out and you know, occasionally providing some kind of intervention with the public, it is about being part of the public and being with the public uh, and using our discretion. And I think in some difficult circumstances we got most of that just about right, but I am very relieved that we are no longer, and that's one thing I think we, people need to hang on to, you know, people actually don't want the police intruding in their lives in that way. They don't want to be told you know, what groups they can gather in. They don't want to be told whether to wear a piece of clothing or not by a police officer. That's not what they're kind of looking for. So I'm, I'm eager that people see that we are kind of um, springing back from that, if you like, and not carrying on in a way that many people felt could result in some kind of, you know, overuse of our powers. Um, uh, and I have to say my colleagues are, you know, delighted not to be doing that kind of thing in the main uh, now. Um, I think we should see the way in which so many people came together, and not just the police, but to help each other, uh, to be community-minded, uh, to think about the, the person next door. And we shouldn't just assume that people you know, will stop caring, have stopped caring, aren't going to carry on with that kind of volunteering and community focus. I think there's a lot that we are bottling and need to and carry on with in society. It did bring much better working um, across uh, the public sector in most respects, and we've kept hold of that. Uh, so our relationship with health, rather, obviously, is much stronger than it used to be. Much more to do. Brought some challenges across the criminal justice system, which are really difficult, uh, and probably showed up that it was less of a system uh, that, than we would like. Um, but overall, I think, you know, working in really effective and powerful partnerships uh, has been shown to be you know, fundamentally important. And we've got, I think we've got better at that. Um, I can't, I don't think it's right actually as a police officer <laughs> to start pontificating about kind of the nature of society and, um, you know, how people now are and things. I would simply say we find ourselves policing a more angry uh, set of people complaining about a wider range of issues more often on the streets, uh, and um, that is, 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 you know, it's challenging. You see it around here all the time. One yeah. person's free speech is another person's um, uh, offensive, or, uh, you know, why isn't this a crime, or, or really, you know, harassment, an aggressive harassment. Um, and that's a, that is a real challenge. Thank you. Another question from the floor. What's your approach to working with ministers and a Home Secretary? Uh, who may have a different agenda from yours. <laughs> <laughs> who asked that question? That's a good question. Um, 
So I mentioned our you know, fiercely held oper operational independence. So I think in our model, in our culture, uh, and indeed enshrined uh, to a considerable extent in our, in our, uh, our law, um, that the individual police officer, constable, has the discretion to decide when and where and how to use their powers that an individual chief constable decides uh, has, has operational independence. So, for example, entirely hypothetically, but no, let me take it into real life some time ago. Um, you know, you will know that at, at one point the Metropolitan Police uh, undertook a series of investigations uh, into um, apparent criminal activity related to parliamentary expenses. Some people were brought to court uh, and to justice for that. Um, you'll have your own views about how well or badly we did that, but I one thing's for sure, I think you would all think, <laughs> I think we did it really well, but one, you know, proportionately and properly and without lots of show and shout and working closely with the prosecutors. But one thing's for sure, the public need to know that we will do that without fear, without favour, impartially, and in an operationally independent manner. That if there is a protest out there now, neither the mayor nor the Home Secretary can or should tell me how to police that in tactical terms and how much uh, leeway, if you like, to give individual groups in terms of uh, their um, uh, interference with other people's rights. That is my decision, or rather my gold commander's decision. And people, I think, in this country are very keen on that, that the police are not an arm of the state. But you can hear a big but. <laughs> the big but is policing and politics are, of course, uh, you know, intertwined. So I try to patrol that boundary of operational independence like a, a tiger, because I think if you lose it, not, I'm not suggesting anybody is actively trying to intrude on that, but if, if you lose that, we're in a, a real pickle. We undermine our confidence in us, we undermine court cases, we undermine the whole sort of basis of the general public consent being the way we decide what to do. Um, but the Home Secretary has a series of responsibilities in relation to policing which are significant and important. She has uh, you know, a series of responsibilities in relation to keeping the country safe and counter-terrorism which are very important. Uh, and um, although the Mayor is my Police and Crime Commissioner, the Home Secretary currently, a, a, a she, has an, a role, both, both have a role in influencing overall um, the framework within which I make my decisions. They, you know, the mayor decides on my overall budget. It has a huge influence uh, locally on our priorities overall. Has the job of holding me to account uh, in very specific ways. Um, and the Home Secretary appoints me and, and uh, or my successor can, you know, can, look, can get rid of me in effect, undoubtedly. Uh, and also has um, the, uh, you know, has the kind of overall policy framework for policing. So having said we'll be operationally independent, I've used this phrase before, nobody wants a police service that's too big for its boots. <laughs> These are democratically elected people who have a very, very legitimate role in, uh, in policing. And if I make a big policing decision that may have about sort of shifting all my resources from you know, this end of London to that end of London, for example, which I haven't done, wouldn't do, but nevertheless, if I did, that has a political implication. And likewise, uh, there, are, there are big decisions that politicians may make which could have a big impact on my operational delivery. So it's a dialogue. It's a constant, uh, you know, um, keeping people briefed. I have a job to advise both about operational policing matters. Um, I am operationally responsible, accountable and independent, but <laughs> I have massive respect for both of their roles and indeed not just them, but other uh, elected people. Uh, it creates quite a, you know, we work in a complex society in a complex environment. Um, critically, they both, in their roles, have a 
very legitimate view of what, what the public want, need, <laughs> expect. Uh, and I, have to, I must and will and do um, listen to that. So if we're going to fight, I'd rather do that, which you know, I'd hope we'd never do, but I'd rather do that privately than publicly. Um, uh, and uh, actually, there's a huge coherence, I would say. Um, you know, they may not thank me for saying this, I don't know, but when you look at what, 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 are we, what, are we really, what are we really thinking are our priorities for policing at the moment, there's not a massive difference, I, I feel. Uh, violence reduction, violence against women and girls, of course, uh, improving confidence. Uh, I could go on. Um, there's not a huge difference between, if you like, those, me as the current post holder and, the, and, and, and their priorities, and their two priorities which is helpful. Thank you. How do you ensure that accountability doesn't overwhelm you, particularly in the context of such tragic events as Jean-Charles and uh, Sarah Everard? Um, so I'm assuming this is quite a sort of pers personal question. Um, I I've talked about the need to that I, I see for all leaders, particularly when it gets tough, uh, and actually all individuals when it gets tough, to sort of m maintain faith, maintain a, a kind of um, uh, a positivity, um, but, and, and a, a personal confidence, but not allow that to be arrogant, to, 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 to keep a, um, a kind of humility. Um, and to try, therefore, to work out what is, what is the right thing to do here. Uh, and um, the right thing, clearly, uh, in any situation in which one is highly accountable, is to, you know, um, step up, be there, stand up, account for, tell the truth, try to ensure that if something terrible has happened, in both those cases something terrible happened, that in, in my roles, as long as it endures, uh, we improve, we make things different, we move, you know, we, we really move things on, uh, and as far as we can, um, possibly treat, treat, you know, those most affected and those most, um, uh, you know, angry and upset about this with, with real kind of humility and respect. Um, and... There is a lot of very, very I'm not, so the organisational answer is there's an awful lot of different accountabilities, <laughs> both formal and informal. In any ghastly event, um, and those are the two most extreme, you know, in, in, in my sort of personal policing service in a sense, uh, I am accountable to the mayor, I'm accountable in a different way to the mayor's office of policing and crime, I'm accountable to the independent office of uh, police conduct, I'm accountable to the Home Secretary, I'm accountable to the, um, any of the investigative or court processes that are likely to follow if somebody has lost their lives. Uh, and in more informal ways, I'm, I'm accountable to the public and my own um, staff. So there is a, um, in not getting overwhelmed, <laughs> uh, there, there is also some very practical things about um, knowing how to account to properly all those different places as far as one can and in a way which is candid and s sequenced and um, in the public interest. Uh, and all of that is, is quite challenging sometimes to work out and sometimes, you know, you cannot please everybody all of the time, uh, of course, however much you would like, uh, uh, because some people will never be if you like, satisfied, but also because um, although one wants to be, you know, completely open and candid from the start, that might undermine a criminal investigation. It might uh, reveal personal information that you shouldn't be revealing. Uh, it, it, it might do all sorts of things. Um, uh, so these are complex things to work your way through as an individual. They're complex to work through as an organisation. Uh, but, 
you know, while you're doing it, that's the job. Thank you. Not to be overwhelmed. Two more. Um, Post-Brexit, how would you describe collaboration with other police forces in Europe? Uh, and are there operational lessons we can still absorb? Um, operationally, uh, extremely good. Um, the Met has quite a big international uh, aspect to it. Leading counterterrorism nationally, uh, counterterrorist policing nationally, means that we have um, about 70 officers working overseas all the time. Uh, we have really regular, um, multiple times a day with some countries, uh, dialogues going on on, on, on individual cases. Uh, and that's sort of around the world, but, but in Europe um, as well. Uh, I think we um, all, uh, you know, I was quoted once as saying in terms of uh, how the um, withdrawal from the EU has gone, uh, and its impact on us in terms of what we can and can't do uh, now. It's probably, forgive me for a second, but it's slightly less bad than we feared. <laughs> Actually, it is, in fact, rather a lot less bad than we feared. But it has, of course, had an impact because um, the, uh, you know, the, the, there are some indices, that, uh, databases that we had set up in a particular way that we can't now just have automatic access to. So if an officer is stopping somebody on the street, uh, they will do a check the, through the police national computer that used to take them straight into some European systems that it doesn't now. And we've had to find ways round, well, not round, ways to uh, replicate that appropriately through Interpol and other methods. Um, so some things, some things are a bit slower uh, and a bit more complicated than they were. But if I pick up the phone to my um, colleagues who are police chiefs in, you know, the, 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 the Dutch National Force or, or Police Service or, the, uh, or Amsterdam or anywhere, which I do very regularly and across many other countries, the uh, actual relationships, the um, working relationships on the ground that make the whole thing work are highly active and very positive. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're re-engineering some things, we're rebuilding some things, and, of course, there are areas where there is still a necessity for some law change in some countries to support some things. Um, but overall, it's, it's, a, it's a very active and powerful set of relationships uh, that we have. An example um, would be um, sharing of, of DNA and fingerprints, uh, th uh, through something called PRUM, which we lead on in the Met. Uh, a a an amazing capability, prescribed, of course, through the law, um, but where we can and are, um, with European colleagues, able to put... Uh, it's, you know, we haven't done it with every country yet, but we're able to put where they've found a uh, mark at a crime scene uh, through our databases and vice versa. So un previously unidentified offenders are are found through that. Um, I, I speak regularly to, uh, or pretty regularly, to the ambassadors from European countries who are, in the, who are here, uh, and uh, I speak regularly to the liaison officers as well, and I think they would give a similar, pretty, you know, surprised thumbs up to where, to where we are, but not surprised by the fact that the police-to-police -police relationship endures and endures really well. Uh, and sometimes there are things that a police officer can do with another police officer that an intelligence agency can't do with an intelligence agency or a government can't do with a government, uh, which is really helpful, particularly in fast moving, for example, sometimes counter uh, terrorist incidents. Of course. Thank um, you. We can get insight in a way that others can't. Uh, this is in two bits, but first of all, uh, this is someone who wants to thank you for your talk. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, what made you want to extend your term, and what do you hope your legacy will be? Mm. Um, a, a strong sense of unfinished business, uh, although I know the business is never finished, of course. Um, a strong sense of service. I hope that doesn't sound too pious. Uh, a strong sense that uh, I and my senior team uh, have some very clear things that we do want to deliver uh, in uh, um, the next two and a half years um, and some, some very clear things that we would like to be around for and feel that we are the team that can really do 
uh, a lot with. So um, rebuilding trust uh, after uh, you know, Sarah has been killed in the way she was by who she was and the surrounding incidents. Raising standards in a number of different ways uh, that relate to that. Um, continuing to uh, drive down violent crime on, on the streets and particularly that which relates to our young lads and that which relates to uh, um, drug, drug related sort of offending, drug, drug dealing and the violence associated with that. A real strong um, sense that uh, the public are asking us to nationally and in London up our game in relation to certain aspects of violence against women and girls and we think we will and we know what we're going to deliver there. A real passion to bring with the growth that we've had a greater presence on the streets of London. There has been a greater presence in the last two years but we're getting more and we're going to put that into people's, if you're a Londoner, you know, listen in, you're going to get more officers in your town centres in particular and in those wards that have uh, you know, high violence, low trust, and they're going to be dedicated there, they're going to be problem solving there, and they're going to continue to drive down uh, crime. Uh, you may not know, for example, that this year we're already at uh, a lower level of gun crime than we were in 2010. So there's a kind of trajectory there of further achievement that I think and we can do. There's a couple of things coming up in the next year which will be very challenging for um, the Met beyond those cultural challenges that I talked about. And we're bringing in somebody independent, uh, Baroness Casey, to have a real hard look at our standards and our culture. Uh, and we will respond to that and the government inquiry positively to, to make a stronger, better uh, Met that it provides a better service to women and girls that is one where people are more equal, more able to thrive. Although I should point out, for example, my women have higher <laughs> engagement scores. Uh, you, know, you may have seen the Met being characterised as I think of, and I mean, no disrespect here, but as a kind of bunch of blokes sitting around in a coal mine in the 1950s in the last few months. We're not, half my leadership team, whether you take the top slice or the next slice down, the next slice down, you know, are women. Um, but we know we, and they're more engaged and have higher morale than the men, but we know we could be more representative. Uh, we could be a, a better place um, for people to work. Um, we've got some, it's dull, but it's so important. <laughs> we've got some massive uh, technology programs delivering in the coming year, which will transform uh, the way the Met can do its business. They're very high risk and it's not a time to be not there. Uh, and we have things like um, uh, the Platinum Jubilee and a number of big operations next year as well. Uh, and at a time when people are quite uh, cross and they're taking to the streets a lot and protest is very um, kind of high profile, uh, you know, I, I would like to be serving to support my people, i.e. the public and the Met, uh, during that time. But um, if at any point, um, you know, the powers that be say enough is enough, then um, I will, of course, uh, you know, stop with, um, you know, with no argument. <laughs> but at the moment, I want to serve. Thank you. I think this may be one of my colleagues uh, writing on the bottom of a question. Uh, briefly, if you weren't in the police, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> So um, one day, I, not too far off, I, um, you know, April 24, uh, God willing, I will not be in the police. Um, I mean, God willing, it's till then. Um, and there are loads of things I would like to be doing as well in my, in, in, uh, in my kind of more personal life. Um, uh, I started out, sorry, to talk professionally, um, I started out uh, in professional life as an accountant and found out absolutely what I didn't want to do uh, or be, no disrespect to any of you. Um, so I won't be going, but I wouldn't, wouldn't have been going out back there, but um, uh, I also, as an aside, um, applied for the police uh, in my local area, which was Oxford, and was turned down. Um, and uh, then sort of had another go, and, and, and the rest um, is, is history. And as I say, I found something I really loved. Um, I suspect uh, lots of my family thought that I might 
either go into something like nursing or medicine, or I might become a civil servant. Um, and, uh, but what I'd really like to be, as my brother often reminds me, is a professional tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> then I don't play at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, could I thank my colleagues for their help with the questions? Could I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us uh, tonight and making, uh, making all this possible? As, uh, as I was preparing this afternoon uh, for our conversation, Cressida, I was very conscious of what we were asking of you, someone under constant scrutiny uh, to put themselves under yet more scrutiny. Uh, I think we have all met tonight uh, someone who we can see uh, reflects deeply uh, about on what they do, uh, someone who is willing to take criticism seriously, and there's a cost to that. Um, and I've certainly met uh, someone who knows how to make that crucial connection uh, between uh, the words we speak and the behaviour uh, we demonstrate uh, for, uh, for your courage this evening, for your honesty, uh, and for your generosity with your time. We are all deeply grateful. Thank you very oh, thank much. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you very much.